So we pick up in our endocrine part two discussion on the pituitary gland, and we need to take a look at a, a few items related to this. So first take a look at a couple of different naming conventions that we need to be conscious of. The pituitary gland is also called the hypothesis, and the hypothesis means to grow beneath. So the pituitary gland or the hypothesis is growing beneath the hypothalamus. So hypothalamus then, hypothalamus is below the thalamus. So our thalamus is sitting up here, has its interthalamic adhesion. And in between the hypothalamus and the hypothesis, we have this stalk that's in between this connector, and this is referred to as the infundibulum. Also a great circus ride. Come on, come all to the infundibulum. So the infundibulum is this connection between hypothalamus and hypothesis, or pituitary gland. Then pituitary gland has a posterior portion and an anterior portion. The posterior portion is managed by this paraventricular nucleus. So when you think about which ventricle is it parallel to, that would be the third ventricle. So it's in relation to the third ventricle that it's parallel to that. So the, the paraventricular nucleus if you remember, a cluster of neurons in the central nervous system is called a nucleus. A, cu a cluster of neurons in the peripheral nervous system is called a ganglia. So the paraventricular nucleus is feeding its hormones, or it, its specific hormone of oxytocin, into the posterior pituitary gland. So because of this intense neural feed, we also call the posterior pituitary gland the neurohypophysis. And then we also have the this supraoptic nucleus, meaning that it's above the optic nerve. And the supraoptic nucleus is going to release antidiuretic hormone and so it's also part of the nervous feed that goes into this neurohypothesis. These neurosecretory neurons here are going to release these uh, releasing hormones, a variety of releasing hormones that go ahead and impact change on the anterior pituitary gland or the adeno hypothesis. And adeno means gland. So this is glandular tissue in the anterior pituitary gland or the adeno hypothesis. The releasing hormones here in these neurosecretory neurons, these releasing hormones will release into a capillary system here that we refer to as the hypophyseal portal system. And a portal system, system in our, in our circulatory system where we enter a capillary bed from this arterial source. So this, this arterial source then is going to be the superior hypophyseal, superior hypophyseal artery. And so blood flow is coming into this superior hypophyseal artery and running into these capillary beds where it picks up releasing hormones from the neurosecretory neurons. This blood flow then, it's an enclosed circulatory system. So these releasing hormones don't enter the circulatory system at large. They stay within this portal system where they go to the adeno hypothesis 
and in this capillary bed, these capillaries, the, the blood is going to be picking up the stimulating hormone. So the relevant stimulating hormone that the adenohypothesis will release. That hormone then is going to exit through the, the bloodstream and go on to impact changes, say, with the thyroid gland, the adrenal medulla, the pancreas, the gonads, whether we're talking about ovaries or testes. So all of these stimulating hormones then are going to be heading off to some organ that then that stimulation will produce other hormones. Here then another look at the anterior pituitary or the adeno hypothesis and this adeno hypothesis then is receiving its signal for release from these releasing hormones and that signal then is or th those hormones are being transmitted to then go ahead and release a stimulating hormone and it's all through this portal system the closer look then again just a, a refresh on the paraventricular nucleus releasing oxytocin the supraoptic nucleus releasing antidiuretic hormone and those hormones actually being created in these nuclei and being transferred to the posterior pituitary or the neurohypothesis and that then going ahead and, and being released into the bloodstream. The posterior pituitary then not actually creating these hormones just storing them and uh, allowing for connectivity into the bloodstream to go ahead and, and distribute to their locations where they need to affect change. So some of the hormones that we'll take a look at here, if we were to take these hormone choices over here, we go ahead and match these up with the correct area that is being stimulated from the release out of the anterior pituitary or the adenohypothesis. So here, for the production of milk in the mammary glands, we would be interested in prolactin. Influencing growth of muscle and other cells would be growth hormone. Far-ranging impacts from growth hormone. For the thyroid gland, we would see thyroid stimulating hormone that then downstream would influence the release of T3 and T4. T4 is thyroxin, and T3 is a triiodothyronine. And we'll see that both of these, T3 and T4, are key players within the metabolism within the body. Here for the adrenal cortex, then, if we look at the cortex as this outer ring of tissue, and the medulla, the adrenal medulla, is the inside. So impacting the adrenal cortex then would be ACTH or adrenocorticotropic. ACTH then influences the adrenal cortex to release cortisol. Impacting the ovary and the testes or the gonads would be luteinizing hormone, also known as lutropin and lutropin is going to help in the production of testosterone in the testes and estrogen in the ovaries the other hormone that we see here being released is follicle stimulating hormone which is going to be key to egg production and sperm production these two hormones are inspired to be released by gonadotropin-releasing hormone from the hypothalamus, and then their release inspires 
eggs and sperm creation, the release of estrogen and testosterone. Impacting the skin, we hear of skin color, we hear of melanin, and so melanocyte stimulating hormone is an important hormone for the creation of skin color. So all of these, remember that all of these stimulating hormones that stimulate organs downstream were put into their stimulating position through a call from the hypothalamus to release some kind of a hormone that is a releasing hormone version of these hormones that then goes ahead and inspires the release of these stimulating hormones that impacts the other organs downstream. Also remember anterior pituitary gland. Another name for that is adeno hypothesis. Adeno meaning gland, glandular tissue. And that is a look at all of these different stimulating hormones that have a far reaching impact downstream. So now we take a look at some of the hormones that are released from the pituitary gland a little bit more closely and here specifically the anterior pituitary gland or adenohypophysis releasing these hormones. So the thyroid stimulating hormone is going to stimulate the thyroid gland, that's its target. The FSH and LH or follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone are going to have targets of the gonads and follicle stimulating hormone then is going to inspire gamete production or eggs and sperm and the luteinizing hormone is going to inspire the release of androgens or testosterone and estrogen. ACTH, MSH, and endorphin are all derived from the same precursor, pro-opiomelanocortin and the main concept to remember here is that pro-opiomelanocortin is a molecule that can be altered to go ahead and produce these other uh, components or hormones. So ACTH or adrenocorticotropic hormone has a target of the adrenal cortex and in the adrenal cortex there's a portion of that called zona fasciculata that will release glucocorticoid secretions. And glucocorticoids are going to be important hormones that will help with the release of more glucose during times of uh, fight or flight need. Growth hormone then, the most abundant anterior pituitary horm hormone, it, the control of its secretion is handled through growth hormone releasing hormone and growth hormone inhibiting hormone also known as somatostatin. So soma being the body statin to stay in place. The actions of the growth hormone, it's a major metabolic hormone and it's catabolic or it breaks elements down molecularly except that it stimulates protein synthesis which is anabolic. It inspires increased amino acid uptake for protein synthesis, increased lipolysis for lipid breakdown, increased glycogenolysis for glycogen breakdown, to release more glucose into the bloodstream. It also is focused on glucose sparing for the brain or it raises blood glucose so that the brain has access to more glucose. Decreased glucose uptake by peripheral tissues is a part of what it inspires so that it can get more glucose to the brain. Its anti-insulin effects reduce insulin activity and since insulin is about uptake of glucose into our cells of the body, that's going to leave more glucose in the bloodstream to inspire that to be available for the brain. However, prolonged exposure to growth hormone can lead to diabetes mellitus, so one of the type 2 di diabetes types. Growth hormone is responsible for the growth of all tissues in the body. Amino acid uptake is a big part of how these tissues are built. We need amino acids to make proteins, and then that increases protein synthesis, which then will feed into compensatory hypertrophy, that concept that we increase the size of the cell, but not the quantities of the cell. If we do increase cell proliferation, 
then we call that compensatory hyperplasia. Not all of growth hormone actions are direct, meaning that some of these actions that are direct, the impact on adipose tissue, the liver, the muscle. When we enter the liver, however, the growth hormone is converted to an insulin-like growth factor that will affect bone, heart, and lung development, as well as epiphyseal plate cartilage and long bone growth. It's called insulin growth factor because the molecule shape is very similar to insulin. So IGF-1 mediates indirect effects of growth hormone. It is, like I said, synthesized in the liver in response to growth hor hormone being present. It promotes long bone growth at the epiphyses, and it promotes the growth of heart and lung. Now, the regulation of growth hormone secretion, we're going to see another negative feedback series of loops that would say that sleep stress is going to stimulate the hypothalamus to release growth hormone releasing hormone that stimulates the anterior pituitary to release growth hormone that goes to the liver is converted to insulin like growth factor and then the release of insulin growth factor growth hormone uh, are going to go ahead and then have a negative feedback loop which either of those in the bloodstream in a quantity will then release or reduce growth hormone releasing hormone and um, reduce that the release of the GHRH and stop releasing growth hormone and IGF. If we see an increase, increase in glucose and free fatty acids, that's going to stimulate the hypothalamus to release growth hormone inhibiting hormone, which will inhibit the anterior pituitary and not release growth hormone or the insulin-like growth factor. So the hypothalamus constantly monitoring the bloodstream and saying, okay, if we have plenty of glucose and fats in the bloodstream, we don't need to release more because the concern there would be that if we keep high quantities of sugar and fat in the bloodstream, will feed into atherosclerosis. Some endocrinopathies or conditions of uh, disease when we fall out of homeostasis within our, our endocrine system. Gigantism, if there's an overproduction of growth hormone during adolescence or development, we'll see gigantism. Acromegaly would be overproduction of growth hormone in adulthood that would produce a prominent brow, enlarged hands and feet, soft tissue hypertrophy, uh, for instance, cardiomegaly or the enlargement of the heart that is uh, not desirable because it drastically reduces the effectiveness of the heart tissue. Pituitary adenoma, we, we can see this pretty significant growth here in the pituitary gland. Uh, this looks almost five to six times normal size. So this pituitary adenoma was an abnormal growth of the pituitary gland. Another view of that from an inferior view, just an incredible growth. And the pituitary gland, um, when there are enlargements like this, will usually present not necessarily with pain. There, there can be pain present. But most times, these pituitary adenomas will present with some kind of a field of vision disruption because the pituitary gland is placed in a position where as it grows, it will put pressure on the optic nerve and shut off the, the visual signal running through the optic nerve. Another view of the uh, pituitary adenoma, we can see the, the cranium has been uh, removed through craniotomy and then we can see the brain reflected with the pituitary adenoma exposed. You can also see the, the proximity of the, the optic nerve traveling back here to the optic chiasm. The pressure that that tumor put on that nerve probably told the patient that there was a, a reason to go into the doctor. Here is a coronal section of the brain showing this incredible growth of a pituitary adenoma pushing into the lateral ventricles and really 
completely distorting the uh, the function of the, the thalami, all of this ventricle function, and, and drastically compromising the function of the brain. A uh, sagittal view, a scan of one of these adenomas, this incredible growth pushing all the way down onto pons. You can see just how it's even displacing organs. It had to have had a significant visual effect here on the patient. So the approach to work on these surgically is usually through the nose and then through the sphenoid to go ahead and, and remove the tissue. So um, there isn't typically a cranial approach to, to work on these tumors. Then uh, here an example of the Cambridge giant, the um, late 19th century, a, a classic example of gigantism, a pituitary problem with a release of too much growth hormone. We can also see gigantism exhibited hemispherically. So um, the pituitary gland may not be engaged in both hemispheres. It may be engaged in one hemisphere, which would allow one half of the body to develop normally and the other half to have uh, a certain amount of gigantism within it. Acromegaly uh, in a giantess. So here is a, a female giant who has also got acromegaly or that increased size of hands and feet. The, uh, the incredible size difference with, with hands in acromegaly. So this would mean that the, uh, the onset of the pituitary problem that created more growth hormone would have happened after the, de the main developmental phase of, of this person. You can see uh, an increase in the size of the tongue in this version of acromegaly. So whichever part of the pituitary gland producing growth hormone in that nucleus would uh, be affected would then directly impact those specific target organs. So here is a question that we would look at with iClicker. If you want to go ahead and pause the video now and work on your answer. Humoral stimulation is when we think of a, um, a component within the bloodstream that would be humoral or within the humors of the body. Go ahead and pause the video if you'd like to answer this question. So neural stimulation is going to release oxytocin from that paraventricular nucleus and go ahead and stimulate the release of oxytocin. Go ahead and pause the video for this one. So hormonal stimulation, uh, ovaries are secreting estrogen in response to the ho hormone GnRH, gonadotropin, releasing hormone, and this is an example of hormonal stimulation. Let's try this one if you want to pause the video. Negative feedback is what we see regulating release, the, the shutoff of the release of the hormone. And let's go ahead and take a look at this one. Pause the video. Antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin are actually produced in the hypothalamus and then sent to the posterior pituitary for release into the bloodstream. Go ahead and pause the video for this one. And here the hypophysial portal system are detected by the anterior pituitary to then go ahead and release their stimulating hormones. Prolactin is stimulated by a lot of things. Estrogen can stimulate prolactin, nursing, pregnancy, stress, sleep. So prolactin is inhibited by dopamine and some of the actions of prolactin in reproduction would uh, stimulate development of the breast, continued growth during pregnancy, 
lactogenesis or milk synthesis, decreases in libido in both sexes, and it stimulates, on the other hand, parental behavior toward newbo newborns. Some endocrinopathies of excess prolactin can inhibit gonadotropin-releasing hormone and prevent ovulation in women, also known as amenorrhea. And excess prolactin can decrease testosterone secretion and decrease sperm production in men. Galacteria is a problem with excess lactation that can happen to about 5 to 32 percent of women. Gynecomastia is an imbalance of estrogen and testosterone within the body that can produce enlargement of breasts in males. And so this is a problem that can correct itself over time. It may be an acute issue. Here we're going to take a look at antidiuretic hormone that is made within the supraoptic nucleus of the hypothalamus and then released to the posterior pituitary to go ahead and then be released into the bloodstream. So the regulation of ADH secretion is stimulated by increased plasma osmolarity or blood solute concentration. So if we have more solutes than solution, that shows a higher plasma osmolarity. Or decreased blood volume will also stimulate ADH secretion. ADH secretion is inhibited by when we're adequately hydrated, or that would show a decrease in plasma osmolarity or blood solute concentration, or an increase in blood volume. And ethanol will also go ahead and increase the uh, inhibition of ADH. So when we drink alcohol and we need to urinate more, that's because ethanol is inhibiting antidiuretic hormone. So diuresis is another word for urination, and antidiuresis is going to restrict urination. So if antidiuretic hormone itself is inhibited, then um, we're going to go ahead and, and urinate more. So if we're more hydrated, if we drink alcohol, any of those things will move us to go ahead and urinate more or diuresis. Some of the actions of antidiuretic hormone, the target tissues are in the kidney to increase water reabsorption in vascular smooth muscle, so muscle that's within the hollow organs and arteries, it would cause contraction or vasopressin. Some endocrinopathies in diabetes insipidus, we would see copious secretion of a dilute urine and excessive thirst due to lack of antidiuretic hormone. So here, some kind of a problem in the posterior pituitary gland, uh, where, or also within the hypothalamus, where we are lacking antidiuretic hormone, so we're just urinating a lot more than we normally would. If the kidneys could, they would relieve us of 20 liters of water per day. So diabetes insipidus, diabetes meaning like a sieve, and insipidus to be flavorless. So in, in the days when physicians would taste urine to get a sense of what was going on, this urine was relatively flavorless because it was so dilute. Whereas diabetes mellitus, a sweet tasting urine would say that there was a lot of sugar in the urine that wasn't being pulled into the cells. So here, diabetes insipidus, has nothing to do with the pancreas, it has everything to do with a lack of antidiuretic hormone. There's also a syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, or SIADH, where increased antidiuretic hormone can lead to water retention. A syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, or SIADH, can lead to an increase in ADH, leading to water ret retention increased extracellular fluid, volume, and hyponatremia. Hyponatremia can mean that we've had a decrease in serum sodium concentration caused by excessive water relative to the solute. And common causes of this would be something like SIADH, where we have retained so much water that 
our electrolyte balance is way out of whack. So a very dangerous syndrome. Regulation of oxytocin secretion is stimulated by suckling, pressure on the cervix, and orgasm. And actions of oxytocin would be contraction of myoepithelial cells of the breast, which allow for milk letdown, and contraction of the uterus, which lead to contractions leading to parturition or birth. So shifting gears a little bit, we we'll take a look at the thyroid gland sitting in our anterior portion of our necks. And we can see it here just in position floating over the trachea in between the carotid arteries and inferior to the thyroid cartilage over portion here in relation to the cricoid cartilage and uh, sort of shaped almost like a butterfly. Here, the thyroid gland in situ or in position after dissection, you can see the wings of it on the left portion and the right portion, all the musculature of the trachea coming up to the thyroid cartilage here. Here is a normal scan of a thyroid, just taking a look at uh, what would be reflective components within it, say, um, picking up on iodine deposits. Here we would take a look at, uh, this would be considered a relatively normal sized thyroid goiter where the thyroid is expanded and Hashimoto's where it, it can be expanded, but it, it is also, um, the, the swelling can be variable. So the discoloration and the look of it here is indicative of Hashimoto's. So here within goiter, what, what the problem is, is that we um, have a lack of iodine that causes swelling of the, the thyroid. We could also see this within Graves' disease, which is an autoimmune disease that uh, allows thyroid hormone to be created and to run unchecked, disregarding any attempt at downregulation by the hypothalamus. Hashimoto's is another type of um, autoimmune disease of hypothyroidism. It's the most common form of thyroid disease. And uh, in terms of, of these types of, of different sizes of the thyroid and the antibodies that are created by the immune system cause swelling. If we were to zoom into the main structure of the thyroid, we would see these epithelial cells, these cuboidal epithelial cells that ring pools of colloid, which is thyroglobulin. What we're interested in is how do we get iodide, a negatively charged ion of iodide, into one of these follicular cells to then go ahead and through a relationship with some thyroglobulin, go ahead and end up producing T3 and T4 out of our thyroids. Here we look at a scan where we can see the colloid in here and we have our follicular cells out here and some of these in here are parafollicular cells that would be creating calcitonin for regulation of calcium. A close-up here of the colloid and then ringed with these uh, squamous epithelial cells or ringed with these cuboidal epithelial cells and then we have a, a variety of blood feed into these. Looking at this again, just a colloid, the, uh, the structures that are within and uh, another view at histology that you'll see within the lab unit. The end result out of this is the production of thyroxine or T4. So we have these four iodine units on these cyclical structure, molecular structures. And then another component T3 or triiodothyronine. And both of these related in a number of metabolic processes within the body. Here we take a look at thyroid hormone synthesis and we see that our first step here is thyroglobulin being synthesized and discharged into the follicle lumen. So the lumen is just the, the open space. 
So this thyroglobulin is synthesized in uh, like a rough endoplasmic reticulum packaged in the Golgi apparatus into a vesicle and then sent to go ahead and exocytose into the colloid. The next step is that iodide, which is a negatively charged molecule of iodine, that uh, it is actively transported into the cell. And then once it is in the cell, it goes ahead and moves through the lumen of this follicular cell and enters into the colloid where it's oxidized to iodine. So it goes ahead and is adjusted to have a, a two positive charge on it. Then the in the fourth step, it's attached to these tyrosine molecules that uh, then receive those iodine molecules. And we have these versions where there are two iodine molecules. So these are diiodine tyrosine. And then we have these other ones where there's one iodine, so there's mono iodine uh, tyrosine. Those go ahead and exocise out, including a cluster of uh, colloid. And they've also paired up in configurations of four or tetra or three or tri. And once they are moved out, they, they include this thyroglobulin colloid and an enzyme adds in to remove that colloid and then these molecules of T3 and T4 are sent into the bloodstream. So the relationship of iodine in our diets is key to the synthesis of T3 and T4. So if we have diets that are low in iodine, then we can run into problems with proper production of hormones that give us the energy we need metabolically to achieve what we need to do. So another negative feedback channel that we see within the hypothalamus, uh, anterior pituitary gland and the thyroid gland, if we have lower amounts of T3 and T4, then we're going to increase thyroid releasing hormone that will increase thyroid stimulating hormone that will then increase the production of T3 and T4 since those are that prompts the entire follicular system to kick into gear and start working. Some of the effects of thyroid hormone, it's a primary determinant in metabolic rate and some of the effects are manifested as growth and development in the cardiovascular system, neuromuscular metabolism, production of an increase in heat or calories through that we see through metabolism. Some other actions of thyroid hormone. Uh, during growth, it's required for attainment of adult stature and acts synergistically with growth hormone and the insulin-like growth hormone factor uh, one to promote long bone growth. In the CNS, development absolutely requires thyroid hormone. And if we don't have thyroid hormone during development, we'll see um, this lead to cretinism and only a brief perinatal period when thyroid hormone replacement therapy is useful. Proper screening is essential. And if we see hyperthyroidism, we'll have excitability. If we have hypothyroidism, we'll see listlessness. The basal metabolic rate, the thyroid hormone increases the basal metabolic rate and oxygen consumption in all tissues which increases heat production, so it's calorigenic. Cardiovascular and respiratory systems, the effects ensure increased oxygen to tissues, increased heart activity, increased ventilation rate of the lungs. Some metabolic effects are protein metabolism, both anabolism and catabolism. Normal levels are anabolic, excessive levels are catabolic. Increased lipolysis, the breakdown of fats, and glucose uptake is increased into adipose and muscle tissue. Glucose absorption by a small intestine is increased by thyroid hormone. And 
glucose catabolism as well. Here's an example of a thyroid cyst, so something that could produce as a swelling on the throat and possibly have issues with some of the production of, of the various hormones the thyroid produces. Hashimoto's, another view of that again, where we have this autoimmune disease that is breaking down the function of the thyroid. Hashimoto's thyroiditis is, is a case of decreased negative feedback. When we, have, when we have decreased T3 and T4, then we see an increase of thyroid regulating hormone and thyroid stimulating hormone, but our T3 and T4 are not increasing. So normal thyroid tissue here, the colloid, the follicular cells, and then in Hashimoto's, we just see this incredible uh, attack of the autoimmune of, of the immune system that has damaged these cells. A nodular goiter, so just a, a growth within the the uh, thyroid, the the goiter occurring because of problems with uh, lack of iodine in the diet. Graves' disease is another autoimmune disease that shuts off the cell's ability to stop producing T3 and T4. So even though the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland will be releasing um, all of the agents to go ahead and, and reduce this, the T3 and T4 just keep being produced. Some of the inflammatory components that are released cause swelling around the eyes and we see the, the bulging eyes in Graves' disease oftentimes. Graves' disease is increased negative feedback where these cells, the follicular cells, are just cranking out T3 and T4, and they're going to do that regardless of the um, reduction of thyroid-releasing hormone or thyroid-stimulating hormone. Hypothyroid can show kind of sunken eyes. Hyperthyroid can show uh, bulging eyes. The parathyroid glands then, this is a posterior view where we can see muscles of the esophagus, the trachea is anterior, and we have these parathyroid clusters of cells in the posterior portion of the thyroid. We see a decrease in calcium creates an increase in parathyroid hormone and activation of vitamin D and an increase of calcium reabsorption in the kidneys that then activates osteoclasts to break down bone and release calcium and phosphorus into the blood. And then we have an increase in calcium absorption in the small intestine. So parathyroid hormone is doing a number of things to go ahead and increase the amount of calcium that we have available to us in the bloodstream. The parathyroid target organs and effects. We see bone in bone, the activation of osteoclasts. Uh, calcium and phosphorus are released into the blood. And in the small intestine, we see an increase of calcium absorption. And in the kidneys, we see that promote, promotion of activation of vitamin D, the increase of calcium absorption by the small intestine, and the decrease of the phosphorus retention into the urine. The adrenal gland then, as we shift gears into a discussion of it, we see that it's a glandular tissue, kind of a triangular shape, that sits on top of the kidneys. So it used to be referred to as a suprarenal gland, but now it's referred to as an adrenal on top of the renals. And here you can see the, uh, the location of the kidneys and then the adrenals on, on top of them, superior to them. A view the cortex of the adrenal gland with the medulla inside. And some of the, the tissue that we'll be taking a look at, the histology that we'll see within lab. In the adrenal cortex, we see three zones the zona glomerulosa, the zona fasciculata, and the zona reticularis. So in these uh, zones, this zone concept, if we remember that the adrenal gland, adrenal, ad being above or on top of, and renal being the kidney, cortex being the outer portion of this, what we're really looking at here in zona glomerulosa is this outer 
region of the cortex. The generic name for the hormones that will be created here are mineralocorticoids. So these are going to help with regulation of items that we would consider minerals like sodium, for instance. Here then in the next level, we would see a region of the cortex committed to glucocorticoids in the zona fasciculata. Out here, we have zona glomerulosa, we have zona fasciculata, and zona fasciculata is releasing glucocorticoids. So whenever you see gluco, we're thinking about the possibility that a sugar is involved. Cortico is out of the cortex. So we're going to have some kind of relationship with sugars in the bloodstream here. Then deep inside the adrenal gland is the medulla. And the adrenal medulla is what we looked at within the autonomic nervous system being stimulated to release epinephrine or adrenaline and norepinephrine or noradrenaline. In this small region then just adjacent to the medulla this layer in here would be zona reticularis that will release androgens so again these sex hormones that are released out of this region so the adrenal cortex this outer layer with an inner medulla the outer cortex then having three layers that release these generically named steroid hormones that we'll take a look at some specific examples of next. So zona glomerulosa, that outer layer, is going to release aldosterone, which would have a target organ of the kidney, and the effect of that, of aldosterone on the kidney, would be increased sodium reabsorption, increased potassium excretion, and remembering that water follows sodium, then will help keep more water and sodium within the body rather than excreting it. So then zona glomerulosa, these items that are impacted here, this is these are the, the minerals that we're interested in that would make this a mineralocorticoid. The next level into the cortex zona fasciculata would release glucocorticoids cortisol, cortisone, corticosterone, and the target organs are most cells of the body. And the action is that these are essential for our response to stress. So we're going to be releasing sugars, um, making more energy available to the body. And when we're in uh, times of stress, these particular glucocorticoids are key for our response to stress so that we can make it out of harm's way. The glucocorticoids then increase protein catabolism or the breakdown of proteins and this increases amino acids within the bloodstream. Lipolysis then is going to break down lipids and increase fatty acids and glycerol in the bloodstream and then gluconeogenesis is going to increase blood glucose. So we're interested in having more blood for brain function and helping us get out of harm's way. We have a decrease in glucose utilization, meaning that cells of the body have less access to glucose, and this helps spare glucose for the brain. Glucocorticoids also have anti-inflammatory factors, and the way that they achieve anti-inflammation is partially due to their suppression of the immune system. The immune system is going to rush white blood cells and other components to areas of injury, and this increases swelling. So a lot of times glucocorticoids are deployed as a medication or within the body to offer an anti-inflammatory response so that tissues may not be damaged by excessive swelling, or that, for instance, an airway that may be compromised by having inhaled hot gases could be brought to a point of relaxation through the administration of some kind of a glucocorticoid, opening those tissues back up. Glucocorticoids will increase blood pressure through sympathetic vasoconstriction, so the sympathetic nervous system, enhancing this sympathetic nervous system vasoconstriction that's already occurring, say in the extremities, 
to send blood back into the core heart and brain as well as lung function and skeletal muscle function. The deepest level into the layer of the cortex, the adrenal cortex, is zona reticularis, which is an area that releases weak androgens, dehydroepiandrosterone, or DHEA, and androstenedione can be peripherally converted to testosterone or estrogen, and this is more physiologically relevant in females than males, and it has an effect on libido, pubic and axillary hair growth. In the response to stress, then, the hypothalamus is receiving a signal of stress that it will send down the spinal cord and through the sympathetic nervous system go ahead and activate epinephrine and norepinephrine and then within its impact on the pituitary gland we'll see a release of adrenocorticotropic hormone that will release aldosterone and decrease potassium helping us keep more water in the body higher blood pressure glucocorticoids that are releasing a variety of sugars to have access to in this fight or flight response and then androgens that are also assisting within responses to increased uh, to a need for increased strength or energy during this time some endocrinopathies that we take a look at would be Cushing's disease a adrenocorticotropic hormone pituitary secreting tumor so what this means is that normally we're secreting ACTH from the pituitary gland, but if we have a tumor that secretes ACTH, then that can cause an excess of ACTH, and that would be the definition of Cushing's disease. So Cushing's syndrome is where we could have ectopic ACTH syndrome or this could arise from adrenocortical tumor. And so ectopic means that we would have ACTH created somewhere other than the pituitary gland. And that can happen if we have an adrenocortical tumor that starts to produce its own ACTH outside of the pituitary gland. The other way that Cushing syndrome can be arrived at is exogenous glucocorticoid administration. So if, if a person's taking glucocorticoids to reduce inflammation, or for anti-immune properties, uh, there can be a point where those glucocorticoids can cause Cushing's syndrome or this excess of ACTH to be produced. It's called Cushing's disease when it's caused by an increase in ACTH, which causes an increase in cortisol, aldosterone, and the androgens that are held within the cortex of the adrenal gland, the adrenal cortex can cause hyperglycemia by leaving more sugar in the bloodstream, protein catabolism and muscle wasting, so the breakdown of muscle can be a problem with this disease, central obesity, so in the core of the body, also moon face, sort of like a more bloated open face, buffalo hump, so a hump right above, say, C7, supraclavicular fat, so fat above the clavicles can be indications of a problem that, that may be related to Cushing's disease because the storage of fat has to occur in all of these different locations since fat is being released in large amounts from the bloodstream because of the release of cortisol. Can see virilization in women, so the androgens that are released can cause male physical characteristics, hypertension, from an increase in cortisol and aldosterone, and osteoporosis because glucocorticoids cause bone resorption. So this central obesity, problems with a lot of fat in, in the, the central region of the body. And we can see these different exhibitions of the, the moon face, excessive fat in the face, in the middle of the body, and all of these could be indicative of Cushing's disease. As we continue looking at other endocrinopathies, we see Addison's disease, which is an autoimmune disease that destroys the adrenal cortex, causing a reduction in glucocorticoids, aldosterone, and androgens. So what we see then is the pituitary gland tries to compensate with adrenocorticotropic hormone 
because as these components of the adrenal cortex reduce, the hypothalamus still says we need these to function, release ACTH out of the pituitary gland, and that doesn't happen. So we run into a condition of hypoglycemia because we have the glucocorticoids that are not releasing the uh, glucose into the bloodstream. And so we have a lower quantity of glucose in the bloodstream. We can have hyperpigmentation or greater coloring of the, the skin and body tissues because where ACTH is located in the pituitary gland, it's close to where the melanocyte stimulating hormone portion of the pituitary gland is. And usually that's damaged as well in one of these uh, conditions. This can also, with a drop in the androgens, cause a decrease in pubic and axillary hair in women or hair in the armpits. So some images of hyperpigmentation, you can see it showing up on the tongue and under the tongue, on the gums of the teeth, uh, some discoloration within the, the fingers as well. And then also hyperpigmentation in the skin. If this woman's skin tone was usually lighter, then she looks like she's darkening quite a bit because of the damage that's done to the pituitary gland center that's controlling melanin release. In the adrenal medulla, we see a specialized ganglion of the sympathetic nervous system. We remember a ganglion is a collection of neurons in the peripheral nervous system, whereas a nucleus is a collection of neurons within the central nervous system. Within this region, the hormones that are released are almost 80% epinephrine and 20% norepinephrine. And so again, in this area, we're in the adrenal medulla. We're below the cortex that we've been looking at and in the medulla. And so epinephrine and norepinephrine are gonna help the body resist stress by increasing blood glucose, increasing heart rate and vasoconstriction, as well as blood pressure. And what this does is helps move blood from non-essential organs to the brain, heart, and skeletal muscle. So remembering that this, the, the adrenal medulla is under the control of the central nervous system during fight or flight response or sympathetic nervous system initiation. And so it's being managed separately from the hormone response that we see within the cortex, the adrenal cortex that we've been looking at previously. So we're going to also see an increase in metabolism with the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. This is a example of a, a tumor, a pheochromocytoma, which is an adrenal tumor that is usually benign, but it usually has an effect on the hormones released from the adrenal gland that it is then those, those hormones are usually drastically increased. So one of the other um, issues that can occur is a benign tumor growth within the adrenal medulla that causes a, a greater increase of the release of all the hormones that, that it releases. We shift gears and start to take a look at the pancreas and the pancreas being located in this position where it shares part of the the area with the liver. It's also has a close proximity to the stomach and then the duodenum, the entry into the small intestine. And it's the primary regulator of fuel metabolism. Here we see it tucked in behind the stomach. It has this relationship with the duodenum where it will be putting in certain components that, that will help with the digestion of fats and, and other food components. So in here we can see some of the cellular component, the histology of the pancreas, and what we would expect within this region are pancreatic islets that also used to be called the islets of Langerhans. These are where glucagon and insulin are released. And we take a closer look at that, and we can see that we have these white areas that are ducts for the passage of um, any of the the exocrine portions of, of the release into the digestive system. We can also see acinar cells or acini in the multiple 
these cells then are going to go ahead and produce digestive enzymes. And then in these wider, lighter areas, this is where we'll see the cells that, that we're interested in for the release of glucagon and insulin, which are referred to now as pancreatic islet. So in an example here where we have hyperglycemia, so we have a lot of glucose in the bloodstream, we have alpha cells and beta cells within those islets. And in an instance of negative feedback to reset hyperglycemia, alpha cells will decrease glucagon release. So they'll decrease the storage of glucose in the liver, and then they'll increase the release of insulin which will allow for greater uptake of glucose into the cells of the body. In doing that, they will reduce the amount of glucose that's in the bloodstream. On the flip side of that, if we have hypoglycemia, the alpha cells and the beta cells will do the opposite of hyperglycemia. So hypoglycemia, where we have low glucose in the bloodstream, the alpha cells will increase glucagon, which will go to the liver and liberate the um, glucose from the liver to enter the bloodstream will then decrease insulin so that the cells of the body can't uptake glucose as much and uh, will leave more glucose in the bloodstream and we get to the negative effect of reversing the hypoglycemia. Both of these regulations and adjustments by the alpha and beta cells in the pancreas that are actually sensing the amount of glucose in the bloodstream return us to what we would call normoglycemia or a normal amount of glucose in the bloodstream. In the pancreas, the beta cells release insulin and the stimulus for the secretion of insulin is an increase in glucose, amino acids, or fatty acids that are in the bloodstream. When th these increases are sensed, then insulin's major action works on the cells of the body to assist with glucose uptake and glycogenesis, which is the storage of glucose, usually within the liver or muscles. Glycogenolysis is decreased as well as gluconeogenesis. Glycogenolysis is the conversion of glycogen to glucose and gluconeogenesis is the creation of glucose from items that are not from carbohydrate sources. So we see an increase in protein synthesis, fat deposition, and potassium uptake into cells, which then has an overall effect on the blood of decreasing glucose, decreasing amino acids, fatty acids, keto acids, and potassium. We call this hypokalemia. Keto acids then are byproducts of the conversion the breakdown of fatty acids. So in general, insulin's effect on the body is anabolic or building. Alpha cells in the pancreas produce glucagon, and glucagon has stimulus for secretion, which includes decreased blood glucose, increased amino acids, and the major actions of glucagon would be an increase in glycogenolysis, or the conversion of glycogen to glucose, and gluconeogenesis, which is the creation of glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. Also an increase in lipolysis and keto acid production to open up other sources of energy for the cell to work with. The overall effect on blood levels is an increase in blood glucose, an increase in fatty acids, and an increase in keto acids. When we think of glucagon in terms of anabolic or catabolic, glucagon is catabolic, as it's breaking down many of these different larger molecules to, f to end up with glucose or glucose-like energy sources. This brings us to a concept of the insulin to glucagon ratio. That when insulin to glucagon is high, we'll see anabolism or anabolic building. When insulin to glucagon is low, we'll see catabolic processes occur or the breakdown of these larger storage mechanisms to get us more glucose. Some endocrinopathies that we see within issues related to glucagon and insulin would be diabetes mellitus or sweet tasting urine that is in diabetes to be a siphon. A lack of insulin or lack of sensitivity to insulin 
can cause diabetes mellitus. Hyperglycemia or large amounts of sugar within the urine, large amounts of glucose within the urine. Also, hypotension, unreabsorbed glucose, acts as an osmotic diuretic, causing more urination in the kidney, and this will lead to volume contraction or loss of body fluids. Metabolic acidosis or an overproduction of keto acids as the body tries to compensate to create more energy sources since the energy that is being created is not being uptaken by the cells of the body. Hyperkalemia or high potassium levels will occur as potassium is not able to be taken up. The metabolic processes that occur are glycogenolysis, the conversion of glycogen to glucose, lipolysis, the breakdown of fats, proteolysis, the breakdown of proteins into amino acids, and gluconeogenesis, glucose that's created from non-carbohydrate sources. Insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, or IDDM type 1, is glucose intolerance due to the destruction of beta cells within the pancreas. These cells are usually destroyed through either autoimmune or viral vectors. The pathogenesis of type 1 then is a genetic predisposition with developmental triggers of viruses, toxins, or drugs, which will produce an autoimmune effect, destroying beta cells in the pancreas. Non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, or NIDDM type 2, has a strong genetic predisposition with close to 50% risk of developing it if one parent has type 2 diabetes, and it's extremely prevalent in Native American and Hispanic populations. Not autoimmune, but resistance develops to insulin. And it's worsened by obesity, pregnancy, and other stresses like infection. Pathogenesis type 2 diabetes mellitus also has a pre genetic predisposition. Decreased insulin receptors allow for decreased insulin binding. And post-receptor defects within the cell can then increase hepatic glucose production to try to compensate. If we look at this model, we can see that out of the beta cells where insulin is produced, we see that there are a couple different pathways that we can lead that can lead to diabetes mellitus. Inadequate secretion of insulin can add to hyperglycemia. We won't get the glucose into the cell or as many cells. We can have receptor defects that don't allow the insulin to open the gateway for glucose to get into the cell and post-receptor defects, the insulin can allow glucose to get into the cell, but then we have problems converting the glucose or problems working with the insulin. Either way, these all lead to hyperglycemia or higher amounts of glucose within the bloodstream. Some clinical manifestations or the way that diabetes mellitus will show up, glycosuria or glucose within the urine, polyuria, a lot of urine output, polydipsia, a lot of thirst due to so much urine output, polyphagia, a lot of hunger, weight loss, and weakness and fatigue are naturally followers to all of these previous conditions. Other clinical manifestations can be ketonemia, ketonuria, and ketoacidosis. So ketones, which are the byproducts of lipid breakdown or ca catabolic process will present themselves in the blood, the, the urine, and the air being expelled from the lungs. We can have acetone breath, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and Kuzmal respirations, which are deep and labored breathing respirations to try and compensate for high acid levels in the blood created by the conversion of fats to try to compensate for a lack of the ability to uptake glucose into the cells. Some problems associated with too much glucose, we can see glycation, non-enzymatic reaction between sugars like glucose and amino acids in proteins or lipids. So we're essentially getting glycated or uh, sticky with at a cellular level causing problems. Some advanced glycation end products, ages, 
are formed in excess during aging, diabetes, mellitus, and renal failure. And ages are also found naturally in animal-based foods, especially red meats and cheese. Cooking at high temperature and for long times can lead to additional age formation. Grilling, broiling, roasting, searing, and frying can as well. And these are also found in highly processed foods. Ages cause proteins to cross-link, which can then alter structure and function of the cellular matrix, basement membranes, vessel wall components. And ages are responsible for almost all diabetes complications. Ages accumulate in retinal blood vessels, which cause retinopathy, peripheral nerves, which decrease nerve conduction and blood flow, which can end up in peripheral neuropathy or pain. The kidneys will have glomerulosclerosis or scarring of the glomerula, as well as interstitial fibrosis, a clogging of the kidneys, ending in nephropathy. So nephrons within the kidneys can be severely damaged by these ages. Blood vessels, atherial sclerosis, the scarring of the arteries, can then lead to cardiovascular and cerebrovascular mortality. Ages produce vascular narrowing, destruction of vessels, ischemia or death of the target organ, immune deficiency, reduced tissue healing. And so by ages binding to tissues, we see the initial set of problems. And with ages binding to cell receptors, we see the second set of problems. Some injury to tissues that don't require insulin receptors to take up glucose, but when we still have excess amounts of glucose, we, we will see the following problems. Like an increased amount of glucose into the cells, which increases sorbitol and fructose as other molecular versions of glucose and leads to chronic osmotic cell injury like cataracts and impairs ion pumps which then injures Schwann cells which is our myelination on our axons which can lead to neuropathy and parasites of retinal capillaries can have retinal aneurysms and vitreous hemorrhages so big problems in the eyes diabetic microangiopathy a diffuse thickening of basement membranes, mostly through the protein collagen buildup. Some of the, uh, including the capillaries of the skin, muscle, retina, peripheral retinopathy, nerves, and kidney, and peripheral vascular disease. Ocular complications of diabetic retinopathy, cataract formation, glaucoma. And we can also see painful peripheral neuropathy from mild paresthesia, of the feeling of pins and needles all the way to severe pain, usually involving the lower extremities. Autonomic neuropathy, or problems within the autonomic nervous system caused by diabetes, can be diabetic diarrhea, gastroparesis, or failure of the stomach to empty, impotence, orthostatic hypotension, urinary retention. You can also see accelerated atherosclerosis leading to coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease and cerebrovascular disease, as well as diabetic nephropathy or renal failure. So some of these pictures then of uh, difficulty healing and problems with circulation. In the retina, you see a normal retina, and then with retinopathy, just a very damaged retina. Lots of problems caused by the buildup of glucose in the bloodstream over time. Atherosclerosis, these cross sections of the left anterior descending coronary artery of the heart show incredible buildup of plaque and a necking off or closing of this artery. So pretty significant case.